Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Catherine. I'm a research librarian here at the Mount Prospect Public Library. I want to welcome you all to tonight's program, College Planning for Students with Learning Differences. We are here tonight with our presenters, Jill and Jordan, who are from JJB Educational Consultants, Consultants yes, um, where they help students and their families find the schools that are the best fit for the students' needs. And that is in part what they are here to talk about tonight. So thank you so much for being here tonight and thank you all for attending. And I will now turn over to our presenters. Well, thanks. thank you for coming out. I can't say it's a snowy night, but um, we appreciate it. And um, they turned that on and I, whoop, he already did that. So the first thing I saw is I'm still wearing the same necklace. Um, oh, and it's so near and dear to my heart because one of my students who has now graduated college went to Knox. His mother in appreciation made this for me. So every time I wear it, I think of Ben and I, and I love it anyway. Um, so, um, okay, I'm Jill Burstein. Um, got a master's in special ed in my mid twenties and absolutely love the field. I've been a disability specialist in both college and high school. And um, I started this business because Jordan has learning disabilities and ADHD. And I knew he could do college, but I knew he'd need a certain level of support, okay? There was no central place to collect data. So I started traveling and I, I was so pumped. Um, the, the services and the things that were available, um, obviously to him at that point, but now to all our students, uh, were remarkable. And I, they keep getting better, um, especially for kids on the autism spectrum. It's, it's amazing what's out there. So this was back in 99, in 2000, I hung the shingle and um, I started working, helping kids with learning differences find the best match for them. I'm Jordan Burstein, son of, um, as my mom mentioned, LD, ADHD. I um, joined my mom in 2013 after graduating college with a degree in psych. I worked at a inpatient psychiatric hospital where I dealt with adults ranging from 18 to 96 was my oldest patient with all types of chronic, severe mental illness, uh, ran groups, did all types of things, loved it, um, but it ran its course and I was looking for a change, sitting in my mom's backyard and she's like, you know these kids, do you know how to read a neuropsych? What do you think about joining me? And I never thought in a million years we would work together because she was the nagging mom and I was the kid that needed the nagging. Um, but. 10 years, she hasn't fired me, so we're, we're doing pretty good. <laughs> so just a, a short synopsis about my journey, just to give insights and allow you to understand that, you know, some, some of your kids' struggles might seem really rough now, but they can get to where they want to be. Um, I was diagnosed in second grade, um, had an IEP throughout school, had every type of support you can name under the sun, thanks to my mom, uh, whether it was a speech path or an executive functioning tutor or any type of tutor, um, therapist, you name it. Um, in school, out of school, all the time, um, supported <laughs> every which way, right? Um, I was never a confident kid, always felt like I was lazy, didn't really like school. Um, there were math kids. There were English kids. I wasn't either. Um, I was the kid that was like, when's lunch and can I go hang with my friends? Um, and that carried from middle school through high school. Um, and I met with my college counselor in high school who told me, you know, you did pretty mediocre on your ACT score and your GPA is not the best. You know, what do you think about a community college? And all my friends were neurotypical, or seemingly at the time, and uh, they were looking at traditional colleges. And I left crushed at that meeting because I was being recommended yet again for something other than the norm, right? Um, so I went off to, with my mom's help, uh, a great school outside of Boston, and they had an amazing support program. Um, and my constant trend was to start off every year or every term really well 
do really well for about five to six weeks. Um, the workload would increase. My output would decrease. I would stop doing the work, stop going to class in college. And ultimately, a year and a half in, I failed out. Um, well, not technically, but I was I was pulled out lovingly by my family who said it's time Before to come home. Out. Correct. Um, so then I lived with, lived with my mom and dad. The idea was go to college locally, live at home, have the structure of home. Same pattern emerged. Um, and yet again, another a failed experience at college. Uh, that's when I was diagnosed with ADHD. Um, I was depressed and anxious in the basement. And my mom said, you're coming with me. And we met with the psychiatrist uh, who did a quick interview and said, has anyone told you or asked you if you had ADHD? I said, no. Did a new neuropsych, which we had been doing since I was in second grade every three years privately. Um, and the new neuropsych said, oh yeah, you, my friend, have ADHD. And my mom looked at me and was like, now we now we have something to work on, right? Um, so after that, I went to one of two schools in the country that only serves students with learning differences, Landmark College. Um, changed my life. I learned to love learning. That's where I learned to read a neuropsych report. Um, I was no longer allergic to the library. Um, learned to manage my time, um, and it was incredible. Um, and also medication didn't hurt as well. Um, after being there for three semesters, I transferred back to uh, Roosevelt University, which is the second school that I, I failed out of um, and did incredibly well. I was a peer mentor. Um, I was the only student involved with creating the peer mentor program. Um, and we worked with at-risk students. So whether it was low test scores, GPAs, single family, uh, single parent families, we work with uh, freshmen and help them transition into college so that they could be successful. Um, and that's when I really started, you know, finding my way. But it was it was a journey. So you can see, I also have an older, I have an older daughter. Um, she has executive functioning issues. Um, and I was always, you know, my kids champion, make sure they had what they needed in school. Um, and Jordan had been tested all these times for three years and everyone said, no, he doesn't have ADHD. His school, no, he doesn't have ADHD. And, um, you know, it was kind of a conundrum why he wasn't doing well. I started my business to help kids find success. And here I have my own kid who's flunked out of school. He's sitting in the basement depressed, playing video games all, all, all the time. Um, but I always knew, I kept looking at his testing. I kept saying, I know he can do college and he wanted to do it. So that was really different. You can imagine the relief when we got the diagnosis. I'll never forget it. The psychiatrist was shorter than I am. And obviously he's tall. And he said, anyone asked you? And I looked up at Jordan and said, well, wouldn't that be easy? You know? Um, instead of some deep psychological reason why he wasn't doing well in school. So um, it, it was huge, and then he was able to do well. It's That's important because as a special educator, I understand what kids need, okay, my background special ed. And as a parent, I also understand. I've been through it. I've seen the price of not doing well. I've seen how well kids can do. Um, and I, I always kind of lean toward that second one because I know – kids with learning differences can be successful in college. It almost always comes down to the right kind of support. Um, and in a million years, I never thought we worked together. Um, he was so disorganized and he's right. I was always telling him, did you do this? Do you have homework? Da, 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 da. Um, so, and that we've been together 10 years is kind of remarkable. Um, anyone top to having really challenging days with your kid? Homework isn't in, grades aren't good. You know, it, it's it's scary, it's frustrating. Um, and oftentimes, you know, like Jordan, we didn't really have an answer for it. Did you skip one? No. No, he didn't. We've been on both enough since 4.30, so give us a little. <laughs> We're doing good though, right? Right. All right, thank you. Um, all right, the fun stuff, why we're here. Um, we're here because kids with learning challenges 
um, are complex and need special handholding at times and need uh, sometimes a different eye, a different perspective to make sure that they're going to get the support that they, they need. Um, and that's what we do every day. So does anyone want to guess what the graduation rate for neurotypical students is uh, in college? For neurotypical or neuroatypical? Kids without, Kids without any learning challenges. Oh, uh, 60, so 81, oh. 81, close though. Uh, you were spot on with the learning challenges one. So 33%, a third of kids with learning differences graduate college. That's a huge issue. Um, our success rate recently was 92%. Um, and it's solely because we're asking the right questions and that what we're, that's what we're going to be talking about and making sure our kids have the support that they need from the people that can actually provide it because there are amazing support programs in colleges. Um, so how to prepare for college. Um, choose, this is really big, choose an appropriate curriculum. You know, a lot of kids, they, they can be really strong, say in math, but reading is hard for them, reading comprehension, writing. So you might put them in a math class that's a little more challenging, but put them in a, an English class that might have two teachers or they move a little bit more slowly. Um, so getting that sweet spot and looking at every subject, I think is really important. Um, we don't ever want the kids over, over challenged. That's really you know deflating to them. And we certainly don't want them under challenged. And that happens, we see it a lot. We're in North, I'm in Northbrook. Um, where the kids are in classes that are too easy for them. And that that deflates them just as, as much because they think, but I know this stuff and why'd they put me in this class? So picking that sweet spot. Um, making sure psychoeducational testing or neuropsych testing. Does everybody understand the difference between the two? I'm happy to explain it. Anybody? I'll just explain it anyway. Um, educa psychoeducational testing uh, doesn't in go into the emotional, social and emotional stuff. So it's, you know, it's your IQ test, it's reading, testing, math, you know, where are you? Um, neuropsych uh, has an emotional component to it. So they're talking about how the kids are emotionally, um, am I missing anything? No, um, social, emotional, social, mental emotional, health, right. illness, those types of things. So. The gold standard is for the co uh, the colleges want to current within three years of when the kid starts college. Okay. Now there are definitely um, exceptions to that, but since we don't know when our, where our kids are going when we start, we always make sure the testing is current within three years. Okay. Um, beginning of junior year, you can ask if you have an IP. You can ask for the case manager to apply for accommodations for standardized testing. This has definitely changed in the past few years since COVID, um, but we still like our kids to be prepared to take it, even if they're gonna apply to test optional schools. Again, we don't know what's gonna happen down the pike. So getting those accommodations in place is easy. You know, you talk to the case manager, you talk, you know, if it's a 504, you talk to the head of special ed, you know, we, we want extended time, we want this and that. Um, and then they're, they're set up for success or as much success as possible. What? You're rubbing on your mic. Oh, sorry. Um, set up for as much success as possible. Is standard. everyone familiar with test optional? Cool. Um, just in case you're not, a lot of schools are not requiring standardized tests, ACT, SAT anymore. Um, I happen to think it's great. A lot of our kids don't test particularly well um, and it doesn't really show what they know. So since COVID, you know, they're like 70% of the schools that now you don't have to send test scores. Um, again, we think that's great. Did you hear? I can't hear. Yeah, uh, it could be psychoeducational as a school psychologist or any psychologist or neuropsych can be a psychologist. Uh, it could be a neuropsychologist. Yeah. It has extra training. Right be a neuropsychologist because you have that emotional, social emotional piece. Uh -huh. 
Um, you know, Jordan was lucky enough that if he needed a tutor on a subject, we could do it for him. Um, I, I always would go to the school and say, you know, they'd say, Jordan isn't doing well. And I'd say, well, what are we going to do about it? Okay. Because they had a responsibility to help them. That's, that's part of, um, of IDEA, Individual Disability Education Act, that they are going to help them become a successful student, successful learner. So lots of times, um, you know, not lots of times, but there were times, you know, I didn't want to bang my head into the wall any more than I had, and we would hire him a private tutor. Um, I know it's not always feasible, but sometimes like the local colleges, you can get kids and they tutor like, you know, 15 bucks an hour, which can be really good. So there, there are kind of ways to do it. Um, the one thing we see most often is kids with poor executive functioning skills. And I wish the high schools, I wish any school would do a better job in teaching that. Um, when you have a kid in a resource room and there's six or eight kids and one teacher, it's really hard to teach, you know, to individualize it for kids. So um, we use a lot of our kids use executive functioning tutors. And, you know, we get the question all the time, well, if I, if I get one more, one more point on my ACT or SAT, can I go to Harvard? Or if I do this, can I, you know, 70% of what the colleges look at are grades. So some of you might smile and some might think, oh no. And so, you know, but um, they wanna see what the kids have done over three years, okay? Rather than a standardized test, which is one day. And we have kids with, you know, grades that are very middle of the road and they go to college. So don't worry about that. That me, That's sir? you, ma That's me. So what you should know. College are required by law to support the needs of students with learning disabilities. So I'm going to go into this a little bit. When the kids are on their IEP and up to when they graduate high school, um, the schools are required to provide services to help your kids be successful, okay? The minute they graduate and you sign that last IEP, they're not covered with the American with Disabilities Act. And that says that they have to be given access to learning like their peers. So that means they don't have to have special tutors. They don't have to have um, any organizational help. They just get accommodations, okay? So it's really different. On the other hand, there are a lot of learning tools in high school um, that are much better than what the high schools have. We have, well, almost all our kids get a note taker. Anybody, anybody's kid in high school have a note taker? They get a copy of the teacher's or another student's notes? Ooh. I mean, that's amazing because most schools don't do it. It's not okay? common. Um, so that's really easy in college. They do a lot of digital books, which I think are becoming more popular in high school. But there, they're, it's like standard. Hey, you have trouble reading? Let's digitize your books, okay? Um, Meeting with a, so they did a, a study at Southern Illinois, who has really good services, and they did a study probably at least 15 years ago, but I still like it, because what they found, that having that go-to person, that touchstone, that disability specialist, is often really critical to the kids, to the success of a student. So even if the kid is only be seen, being seen occasionally, the kids knowing they have that makes a huge difference. Um, some schools offer comprehensive programs. George's gonna talk about it in more depth, um, which the kids are seeing on a regular basis. Um, often those programs you have to be accepted and the services can, can vary wildly. Um, a lot of our kids do better in college than in high school um, because we can really match the service to, to what they need. So we had a kid several years ago, oh man, she had like a, maybe a 2.0, no, like a 1.9, 1. 1. 1. 1. Yeah. A, a D plus average. And she just wasn't being supported in her school. There was nothing wrong with her ability to learn. So she went off to college her first semester. She had two A's, two B's and a C. Okay. And not only is that a win for her, um, of course, that's hugely important, but it changes the whole family paradigm. All of a sudden her parents can see her as a kid who, oh, you're going to be okay. You can get that degree. You can do what you want instead of struggling academically all the time. Um, go ahead, George. Okay, so levels of support. Um, 
Accommodations is the legally mandated amount of support that any and every college and university must provide students at any school in the country, at least in the US. Um, so that's extended time, that's digital books, uh, Kurzweil, if you're familiar with that, or speech to text software or text to speech software, um, things that don't require students to meet with any staff member, right? Um, no Scantron, et cetera. Um, in the 10 years that I've done this work, I've never had a student at a school like that. And I, no, and in the 100 years, no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we have never had a student in a program like that. I think uh, whether our kids are capable of being successful in schools that provide just that amount of support, our kids aren't comfortable with that amount of support. They'd rather have at least somebody to meet with. So services is the next level up. We aren't the most creative uh, in coming up with, with better terms. Um, but this is the most variant group of schools. Um, these schools provide, they have an office that students can go into and meet with somebody. That somebody could be a dean of students. It could be someone from vocational rehab or a learning specialist, a psychologist, um, their background could be really different. Um, so sometimes these programs are great or these support offices are great for kids. And sometimes deans of students don't really know how to differentiate instruction for a kid with learning issues. Um, the key with these programs is kids need to be really good advocates and not even just advocate, but they or need to know how to advocate, but they need to recognize that they need help before they're in trouble. And for kids like me back in the day, that was not gonna happen. Um, the nice thing about these programs though, is they are not fee for service. They're always free. Um, some of these programs you could be seen weekly and some of them they'll say, yeah, you can come in like three times a semester which I'm like, oh boy, um, that certainly wouldn't work for me. Um, comprehensive services is what Southern Illinois has. So it's fee for service. You typically pay per uh, term um, and you can roll it into financial aid, which is nice. Um, and these are the most similar to a resource period in a high school, but better because you're meeting one-on-one -on -one with your learning specialist. So you meet anywhere from once to, boy, four or five times a week with your learning specialist. Some of these programs allow you to go in every day. Um, you can meet with your learning specialist to work on executive functioning and writing and things like that. Um, and then they have professional tutors often to work on content. Uh, so if you're taking calculus, I shake every time I say that word, um, you can meet with a learning specialist and get as much help as you need. Uh, we had another student at Southern Illinois. I promise we don't just like send every student to we Southern do. Illinois. Really. Um, but she had a significant math disability and she wanted to study education initially. So her first semester, they're like, you need to take this math class. She went in every day to the Achieve program, which is their comprehensive program and got help every day after class with the work. And she got through it. She ended up changing her major, but that's, you know, that's the beauty of college. Um, but these comprehensive support programs really allow students to have that touchstone. Um, and a lot of these offices also allow uh, like a community, a smaller community to be built within a larger university. Um, one thing that we did not list here are uh, young adult transition programs. Um, some of our students uh, may not be ready to live in a dorm or may have some core morbid issues with depression or anxiety or have gone to college and previously struggled. Hi. Um, and there are residential programs where kids can live in a supportive community and attend college at the same time. So whether it's someone who was failure to launch someone who socially dorm life might be really complex for due to autism or something similar, social communication issue. Um, 
there's amazing options uh, like that. They also work on hygiene, all types of stuff like that. Um, so it is. And these names are our names. So yes. if you call a college and say, do you have services? They want to know what you're talking about. Um, comprehensive, they will. Correct. Okay. I think I think if we could hold uh, questions to the end, I would appreciate that. Thank you. And if you're like me, please jot it down. Otherwise, that's going to leave you in two seconds. Um, oh, ta-da. I already, uh, I guess I jumped the gun. Didn't even know this slide was in here. So these post-secondary programs. So college able, not college ready, or you previously went, struggled, right? Um, so a lot of these programs are on college or like directly off college campuses. Um, so students still feel like they're living in a community um, and they're gaining all the support that they need. Um, and then we also work with students who um, cognitively, college may not be the right option for them. Or I'm seeing more and more kids who just say, like, I know college is like what I'm supposed to do, but like, I like working with my hands. What else is out there? And there's amazing options like those two um, that also provide similar independent living support as well. Sorry, I stole your slide. It's okay, I'll live. <laughs> <laughs> Overzealous, I guess. Okay. So what we do, um, all of the students we work with are neurodiverse of some size, shape, or anything. Um, I always say, if, if your kids don't have anything, they're not for me, because the weirder, the better, if you ask me. Um, and I say that lovingly, obviously. Um, all, uh, I would say, 85 to 90% of our kids come to us saying, I want to go to college. Um, and the ma majority of them uh, do. Um, we also help them find two-year placements, uh, post-secondary options. Um, I am an executive functioning coach, which still cracks me up because I was an executive functioning nightmare back in the day. Um, and then throughout high school, when we're working with families, we're helping with the curriculum guidance and talking about testing and all that fun stuff. We provide summer options for our kids. So many of our kids, similar to me, school, the school year is draining and it's really hard. And my parents did a great job of uh, providing me options during the summer that really lifted my spirits and lended to my strengths. Um, so I, did a bunch of fun social stuff um, that had nothing to do with academics. Um, and it was fantastic. And then gap year options are also wonderful, uh, kind of allow you to slow everything down, get kids out of the classroom and kind of off the train track uh, that people tend to feel like they have to be on constantly. Um, so yeah. So this is, Pretty, pretty self uh, explanatory. Be an advocate for your students. They often don't always know what they need, what they want. And so even he would complain that I was the pushy, you know, obnoxious mother. Um, it, it was my duty to be so. Um, lots of great online online resources, Chad for ADHD, LD Online. Um, I would say in the past five years, our number of kids with autism has grown enormously. And um, they often have really, um, you know, decent cognitive profiles. They can do the work, but there's so many other things that get in the way. Um, that social communication skill, not being able to feel like, you know, make a friend and keep a friend um, can be really problematic for them. So, and then work with professionals. Um, gosh, there are just so many around now. I mean, we have a, you can call us or just about any professional. And a lot of them take insurance. And we do like, especially our kids with autism, we can put them in a social group and, it, and insurance pays for it. So, um, you know, we're always looking for ways to support the kids we work with because um, it really takes a team. Okay, we're at the, we're at the good part. Please.
Hepperos, I know you had your hand up really early. Do you, yeah. Yes. So I'm going to give you two answers. What okay. they're going to do is enough for college. Usually. That being said, if your son has his profile has changed or he's still struggling, I'd encourage you to do the neuropsych because you're going to get much more information. That being said, it's really expensive. So, right. I mean, if we have a choice, someone says, should the school do it or should we do it privately? We're always going to say do it privately because there's some, you know, they're just more thorough. The schools, you know, you have to tell them, don't do a partial IQ test. We'll pick the part, parts of the kid's profile that are weak, okay? Say reading comprehension. And they pick all the weak things and the kids come out, you know, with these really low numbers and it doesn't give you an honest profile. Plus the colleges won't take them. They want to see the whole, you know, the robust um, learning profile of a kid so they can help them. Right. You had a question. I understand that you started going strong, rescue students, but if a student has already taken the gap year and it's now happening, it's like had an opportunity. Yeah. So, it's a different way to approach the whole school. I'll take it, sure. Um, not really. It's the same process. I think the beauty of where he's at is he has a further maturation, further understanding of himself. Hopefully, maybe a little bit more of what he wants. Um, I think a lot of high school juniors are like a deer in the headlights when you're like, what do you want to major in? They're like, oh. Um, so in that way, it's going to be more targeted, but he could still use his test scores. He's going to use his high school GPA. Um, on applications, when you do take a gap, they do ask um what did you do with the time? Um, so he'll write a paragraph about what he did during his time, whether it was working or traveling the world or anything in between. And yeah, but process-wise, identical. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so I know you said that only about 37% of students with learning disabilities graduate. Yes. Yes. Obviously. Yes. So when you're looking at the right fit, we've done a couple college boards and things like that. Are there questions to ask or ways to find out which schools are going to provide? Let's say, I know probably the majority of schools don't have that highest level of support, but like that middle level of support services. Yep. Services. services. Yep. Is there a way to find out which ones will have that versus, um, you know, just the basic accommodations? Are there questions you should ask when we're looking at, even, you know, even bothering them to the school? Like yes. So you've had nobody that's just gone to the school. Like with a, that doesn't mean they shouldn't, but yeah, we have not. I mean, I think the kids, you know, we talk about them having a touchstone. Mm -hmm. And so they like that idea. And it, it doesn't cost any more. There are lots of colleges that have that. So it's never been an issue. Um, you can go talk to the disability people, okay, and ask them, um, you know, how many times the kids uh, are seen a week. You know, do you help with writing? Do you have peer tutors or do you professional? Who does content tutoring? Um, you want to talk about college supports? Yeah. Uh, it was, it was, we also have a subscription-based website. I think it's $180 a year. 
and we provide detailed uh, information about disability support programs across the country. Um, so if you don't want to go and do all that legwork, we've done it for you. It's collegesupports.com. And we have a database so you can search for schools with that language, accommodation services or comprehensive, um, and we update them annually. Um, so. And the, the the disability people they don't want to they're not they're not admissions. No. Okay, meaning they're trying, not trying to sell you. They really only want kids who they can help. So you know, I, I have found that they're good people to go to. You know, I have a kid who you say, and and they're going to be honest with you whether they can support him or not. Because yeah. they don't want to see kids fail either. No. Well, the second question I have, John, is my son has executive function even auditory processing. So foreign language is a big deal. Yep. And I've noticed that even this colleges that don't require it to get in, and he has one year, but if, if they don't require it to get in, they are still required to graduate in many subjects. So how often do you see um, substitutions, I think we're calling it, yeah. for, you know, not doing foreign language, but instead doing like a culture class or something like that? How often is that? I mean, I uh, culture as a substitution, no, but but American Sign Language is a great sub um, that even kids that just haven't been successful in foreign language, they really like it. Um, so that's what I've seen. Um, but there's a lot of colleges that you could get foreign languages waived. Not even a substitution. As long as it doesn't compromise. Like you can't be an international right. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah. studies major without yeah. a foreign language. Right. But our kids go towards their strengths. Yeah. You know, so it's unlikely a kid who were foreign languages hard, they're gonna say, Oh, I wanna speak six foreign languages. Right. You know, they're gonna especially in the beginning when they really don't know what they want often, you know, they, they kinda stay away from that stuff. So you've seen a lot of waves, waivers that yes. That's good. Yeah. As long as there's documentation, yeah. Right. I was actually for a couple questions. I think it's my experience. I'm a little further ahead in the process. One of them is that, yeah, all of these, we all sound specific. Take that into consideration if they're choosing which policy, like, you know, what their disability wants. Um, number one, I mean, another choices, which is already happening with college fair mm -hmm. through the North Shore. I think they've already had this year, but yeah. they, I think 214 has one that I'd like to see better. Um, so they choices, yeah, I think it's really Yes, I was there this there. year. Yeah, yeah, I go a lot. It did. Just know when I, I didn't go this year, when I looked at the list of schools, though, some of them made me raise an eyebrow. Like, why are you here? Made me raise an eyebrow because their support isn't that good. Uh, yeah, I um, think that when I some are great. There were, a lot of, there were a lot of schools there. Yeah. It was huge. It's like, huge. huge. It's a circus. Like, like that all. University of Wisconsin Whitewater is supposed to be really good. I, I, I yeah, it is. About Whitewater. So Whitewater, University of Wisconsin, Whitewater was right next to University of Wisconsin, Oshkosh, okay? Yeah. Whitewater, you have to be a good advocate. They don't pull the kids in. And yet they have this reputation of like being fantastic. Oshkosh, on the other hand, is a fantastic program. It was started by a PhD. It's, they, I, it is very much was created for kids with, um, verbal, you know, language-based learning disabilities, but I think they do a lot of stuff now. So um, I have a kid there right now, freshman with ADHD. And he's, Whitewater? Yeah. He's, um, Oshkosh. he's got one at Whitewater. I got one at Oshkosh. Yeah. But do you feel like Oshkosh provides more better services? Than yeah, one? yeah, I do. And yet Whitewater, and I, I can tell the, you the other name that's always run around Arizona. is the University of Arizona, and everyone talks about the SALT program. Um, we're not real fans. They have changed it a lot. Kids only get 30 minutes a week and not even with learning specialists. And the accommodations are down the block in another office. It's And they don't communicate. So yeah. they aren't going to work collaboratively. 
So kids are like playing two offices and trying to figure, piece it all together when they're like, I need you to piece it all together. <laughs> don't make do, don't make me do it, right? There's also a point for colleges to change lives. Well, some of those schools are, I think, are a little on the iffy side, but they do have the college fair that comes around too. And the books here at the library. Delightful book. It, I mean, we, we love those schools, but it doesn't have any, you still have to, the biggest mistake, I think, when we get kids who transferred and they failed out of their schools is nobody looked at the support. Okay. And so, you know, we consider the two most important, at least I do, two most important things, the support and the social. Kids yep. have to have friends. They got to find kids and they have to be supported. They'll find the majors. They'll find the activities, that stuff. So um, often the smaller schools, sometimes they do a better job and sometimes not. You just always have to ask the questions. You know, I mean, we love Beloit and the last woman who was there was pretty much a disaster. But now there's somebody new there. yeah. Yeah. And he's doing okay. Say just a little side note. So the second semester question here. Um, this financial aid was pulled away because um, it was like a issue. Mm. And now he's even the last night. Just so you know, mom. I'm uh, applying to Yale uh, for um, next year, which was the attorney. And um, and they have this program showing you like six to seven thousand dollars above like when I'm at Iowa State and current financial aid check right now. I you know I have no idea when that just came out of <laughs> so, feeling good about himself. Talk over Thanksgiving. Yeah, there you go, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. But again, it's important to ask those questions because if a kid's not supported they end up home, okay? And it doesn't have to be an overwhelming amount of support. It might just be that person they go in to see once in a while um, for whatever reason. Um, but I would say almost without doubt, the kids who don't do well, it's because, you know, they're not supported. We had a kid, we didn't place him at Purdue. Kid's brilliant kid on the spectrum, okay? And mom kept calling Purdue and saying, he needs help with executive functioning. And Purdue kept saying, we don't do that. They don't have to do it, okay? They only have to provide accommodations. And, you know, she was banging her head against the wall. He's in the honors engineering program, okay? So it was a mess. We moved him. We took him, uh, you know, we moved him to a program that had really good executive functioning supports as well as a spectrum, pro a spectrum program. So they had friends. He had a social group. And the kid, you know, the first semester made the dean's list. And that probably is still up on my bulletin board at the moment. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with Purdue, okay? It's not Purdue's fault, but you have to know what they are. Or the right kid. Right. It's funny because I have another one. There you go. <laughs> with that one, yeah, that's hospitality. She she went to Indiana, so I grew up believing, oh, no. believing per don't, no, not Purdue, right? You know, it's not, it, it often isn't the school's fault because usually they're pretty forthcoming with what they will offer, especially the disability people because they, like I said, they don't want to have a kid they can't help. Right. They don't want to, you know, be banging their heads against the wall either. So, you know, knowing what they offer and how, you know, how, my first question is how often can the kids be seen? If they say, well, once a month, you have a lot of information there. Okay, a comprehensive program is going to be one to four times a week. And lots of times they have like study rooms, the kids can come in, they socialize, they do their homework, they can get help. Um, there's just, you know, there's great stuff out there. Go yeah. ahead. So I said, is there um, is I mean, you know, obviously they can't make the kids do stuff, but there are all kinds of things that are built, you know, that can be built in. It really depends on his diagnosis. I don't, you know, want to ask you, but um, 
but there are programs that have required social activities built into their support programs, whether it's you need to join a club and a peer mentor will go with you to join to this club until you're comfortable and you're assimilated. Or we host a weekly activity every weekend and it's switched up and we want to see you there. And if you have a recommendation of what you want to do, we will make it happen as long as it's safe. Um, there are colleges that take kids paintballing or bowling or live action role playing, all types of really fun things so that they're not sitting in the room on Twitch 24 seven and, you know, avoiding the rest. Yeah. You know, again, you know, like when we interview them, you know, we're asking, let me just say like a kid on the spectrum. Okay. So we're asking executive functioning. What are you doing for executive functioning? Cause they almost all need it. Okay. What are you doing for social? Um, kid autism is social pragmatic disorder. So we want them even more than the content tutoring often to, to start learning social pragmatics. How do you keep, how do you make a friend? How do you keep a friend? Okay. Those things are really important. And so, you know, what kind of activities do you have for those? Um, do you provide some have like therapists on staff and the kids are required or can have the opportunity to see them once a week? Um, so again, it depends on every individual kid. And, and what kinds of things you, you want supported for them. You know, we've had kids um, like on the spectrum at school and their social skills are pretty good. And so they don't need a whole lot, um, but most of ours do. Um, and we think that's again, more important than content tutoring oh, yeah. because learning how to live in this world with other people working in a group, it's not a small thing and it can be really confusing for them. Social about, uh, about oh, yeah. Nonverbal learning disability. Yeah, absolutely. Me too. So, yeah. <laughs> My daughter. The other one. <laughs> she had a seizure disorder when she was little. And it, yeah. So, I mean, she's 42 years old. Okay. She has friends. She goes out mostly. Um, but she'll never have 3 million friends and be in the middle of a whatever. Huge right. group, of, you know, small groups are better for her. But she's learned how to make it work. Mm -hmm. She's still disorganized. Lindsay <laughs> <laughs> Viola. <laughs> um, did not graduate from high school. And I was just curious, I got the impression that if you stay outside of high school for like a semester, you don't have access to your high school anymore. You do happen to know. Oh, have access in terms of resources? Yeah. Hmm. I I would question that. Yeah, I don't I know, know for sure, but I highly it doesn't sound right. But I don't know for sure. That's a question for a Sorry. special ed lawyer, I think. I mean, if you if they're under twenty two, right, and they have special needs, schools require to educate them. Um. You know, it's there are a lot of moving pieces with that. So, yeah. but I don't. We dropped the IEP because we had them wanting the therapeutic based program. We just wanted them to do the best we could because I didn't think of that. Yeah. So the problem was that it's cold here. Oh, and gosh. I was out of the from freshman year, my dad gets a senior, and he was like, I was a little smell in the biggest. I can't relate yeah. to this. And then it helped it and stutter. So, with the math requirement, Kids were like, they can't understand you, so they pulled the mask out and they would try to suspend them. Sounds about right. Was, you know, it was just. That's hard. Circus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Um, other questions? You know, our cards are over there. Feel free, you know, to, to take them, to reach out to either of us if you have questions. Um, if you want to sign, sign um, on our sign up sheet, Jordan does a blog every month. And we can get you on that. And we also have a Facebook page. It's a support program for parents whose uh, kids have learning issues and want to go to college. Do you remember the name? Yeah, I saw that coming. What's the name? What's the name of it? <laughs> when you get all college, that? Bound, college bound chat for students with learning differences. And there are the other parents you can talk to. You know, yeah. it's not just so us. So people just. Giving recommendations. Talk, talk shop. College bound chat. 
for students with learning differences. And it's 700 parents, um, some with kids in college, um, some with kids preparing for, et cetera. So people share information on there all the time. Yeah, go ahead. So um, my granddaughter has a friend who goes to school in Iowa where it's a in the neighborhood. Um, and yeah. Cornell? Carol. Carol's not in Iowa. Oh, that's in Ohio. And, and Montana. That's Cornell. Oh, class. Cornell. One class at one class at a time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and so one of one of the challenges that my daughter has, um, you know, by the eight classes or seven classes, school and by the time he got to the third one, you know, right was right. It's just like that was that's not the way it comes. Yeah. Uh, wow. And you know, and, and he was going to go to Sure. And, and so they were going to confine them to their rooms and do everything online. That's a, that's a great experience. Yeah. And then if they got sick, they'd send them home. Right. Yeah. Per million dollars. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Um, but, but the notion of you know, like, so we were working on spacing classes out so it wasn't so concentrated. But the notion of one of the times, interesting, an interesting notion. I just wondered if you had an opinion about that because the workflow is not I have a big opinion about that. We um, always have opinions. <laughs> <laughs> we're good at that, if you can't tell. What's your opinion, uh, sir? So when last time we went to visit, we were speaking with the disability office there, and they flat out told us, if your kids have processing issues that are moderate to significant, they're not going to do well here. It's really quick. Each class is three weeks. You are in a classroom for four hours a day, and then you have homework. So it is a lot of work, but for a kid with attentional issues to be focused on one class at a time, not needing to shift, that's great. But if you have processing issues, you can't get behind. That's a problem. Executive function, yeah, you cannot get behind. Right. But it's. I love I love the school. Me too. Because you, know, you get to learn things and made in real depth. You get to study them, but again, processing you're gonna you know you can get behind them. Executive functioning if you're not doing the homework, you can be lost in two days. Yep. My yep. class goes three weeks. But it's a great school. I looked at that when I was going to college forty years ago. Um, it was first of all the town for me was just too small. It's like, tiny. Uh, but that was a different issue. But I will say that. Um, I uh, I wanted to be a business major, and I but sociology I got my back work. Sociology is mean probably wants me to be, but I'm counting and stuff. I was always talking a little bit more. But I had to take three sessions, and I had to take three hours um, before I graduated. And I found that because um, it's like kind of like a lot like that, like a whole lot at once. That I just couldn't like process that much information when it's complicated, like. You know, or like how the economy works for accounting. I couldn't think a topic like that myself and, and be able to read like four hours of it's a lot. And, that, and those topics, just for me, I would need like, you know, to learn like an hour's worth and then an hour's worth a few days later. That would just be for me, but I just found that. Well, and it's interesting because the person I know who goes to, um, there's a couple of things. One is that it's so small that it's mm -hmm. not really like <laughs> um, it's not it's tiny. But it's it's the parent making that comment, not not the student. Oh, well, the student. It is small. I mean, that's something you you know you know that going in. Like we read student reviews of things, and and a kid will say, "Boy, is this school expensive?" I'm like, "You knew that going in. Right. You know how big it is going in." And so, you know, we have conversations with our kids, like, "What's that like to be with a thousand kids?" You know, um, 
It's not I for everybody. Mean, when I was just looking at it, you know, I, I read it across myself, and I was like a baby boomer, so we had almost 2,000 up there at the time. And um, I was like, oh my God, the cost of mine's already big enough in high school. 600 kids? I can't even imagine there's already here 600 of us. That's why I'm kind of raising my head to go to Cornell myself. But I just remember thinking that yeah. myself, like, oh my God, this is going to be the first one for my high school. Like, yeah. almost, you know, three times as big. Sure. And I was kind of branching out just the size it yeah. thing. Um, we, I went to one of the, the IEP kind of college fairs at Harper that they had, and um, Boris College, which is yeah. very small, mm -hmm. um, they were there, and they, they seemed good, but, and then also Elmhurst, which has a new, they have Elsa and the other they have Vantage now, they yep. and yep. so, I'm kind of curious about your idea of the that, and also just, do you tend to see the more supportive programs in smaller schools versus the large universities? You know, because I know University of Iowa was also there, and they claim to have also support but. Okay, so that's what I'm wondering. So, and are we better off kind of thinking about smaller schools and about kind of socially? It might not, it might not be like more like high school, but is it more supportive? And have you heard some things about Elmhurst or Lawrence? Yes. Well, okay. Lawrence has great support. They also have, they have good academic support. They have a good autism program, you know, small school and, and Dubuque. So you have to want that. You know, I think the problem I see with the big state schools is they have to, you know, provide some funding. And it's not always easy. Not all our kids are going to small schools. I mean, we have kids all over the place. Right now, the hot schools are the medium ones. They kind of 4,000 to 10,000, a little bigger. Um, you get the best of both worlds. And so, you know, we, we don't say, oh, you have a learning disability, you're going to be better off in a smaller school. Okay. The kids all over the place. It is a little harder at the big state schools. Well, they they use their graduate students, so they're providing their graduate students hours towards their degree while working with undergrads. Um, so, and it's not you don't get a lot of hours per week and you're talking about a school that is super social so if your kid is social like me and rather go hang out with friends and go to the big parties it's a problem it's it's an amazing writing program but we've had kids at Iowa you know, um, I think it depends on your student. It really does. Um, I never say no to a school. I, you know, I, I, I'm a little bit of a cynic. You know, I've, I've been in the field a long time and I lived through what well, we went with him. Through with him was not a small thing. And now we can kind of, you know, roll our eyes and stuff. But, you know, this kid was sitting depressed in the basement and we, you know, it was really hard. So, I work really hard to make sure that we don't have, you know, send kids off and they're going to become Jordan. Okay. So I tell every family, I'm conservative about this stuff. You can take chances, but I, you know, um, I like to see our kids have what they think they're going to need. Okay. And not take, take chances. Right. And some families will take chances. That's their choice. Okay. That's their right. But you know, like a school like Iowa, I mean, they used to have really good support and slowly it's, it's all gone. And they were here a couple of years ago. They did a breakfast for consultants. And this guy was talking about some supports. And I went up to him after I said, oh, he added supports for kids with learning differences. And he says, no, we really don't have anything. Now they have a REACH program for kids with cognitive disabilities. That's a different story. But in terms of their everyday supports for kids with learning stuff, there's not much there. And so, you know, can you have the same experience? Say you go to Michigan State, okay? Big state school. Big Ten, very similar experience, same kind of majors, better support, okay? Neither one is horrible to get into. So we've had way more kids at Michigan State. Makes sense, right? Kids don't know an Iowa from Michigan State. It's all, they just want the big rah-rah and the sorority and, and things like that. So we might as well send them where we know they're going to be supported. Um, we had twins. One, this was years ago. You don't even know them. I do. Um, and one, one was... Um, didn't have any learning issues. 
and the other was trying to decide his brother was going to Michigan State, the neurotypical one, and the other was deciding Michigan State, Arizona. Well, at that time, Arizona, the SALT program was really good. So he's deciding really good services or Michigan State where I have to advocate and there are people to help. And, you know, he decided on Michigan State. He was fine. Okay. You have to know your kid. I just ran into his mom. He's working. His brother's getting married and all's well. That's I love when we hear what our kids are doing. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. And, you know, if you have questions, please feel free to, to reach out to us. Other resources. Um, Fair Test is a good website if you're looking for test optional schools. They have a comprehensive list. Um, other resources that we use for college research with students is uh, Niche, N I C H E. Um, student reviews, those and are student reviews. That's where we sit with kids and read through student reviews. Um, give them a sense of what kids that are at the actual school are talking Unigo about. UNIGO gives great student reviews, U-N-I-G-O. That's another one. But yeah. Because um, it's important to get the social culture, right? Right. You know, you can't say to a kid, oh, you're wearing disability, you have to go here. You might not have any friends, but it'll be okay. No, it no. won't be okay. No. You know, the kids have to find people like them. Around here? Email me. I have a great guy. Uh, Justin? Justin Larson. He's hard to find. I need to like hunt my resources to find his email and phone number because he doesn't have a website, but he does amazing okay. social groups um, for like young adults and high schoolers. And they, they go out to dinner, they go to Six Flags, they do all types of really fun stuff. He's teaching them social uh, pragmatics in real time. They're right. not sitting around talking about it. Oh, if a girl said to the, you know, so he's, he's taking them out in the real world, which we love because they're learning it. They're doing it. They do it. Right. And they, they're having a good time. They don't know their lens. I forgot his training. I think he's a he's social, social worker. Social worker. Yeah. Oh, okay. And his wife's a psychologist. Um, you know what town um, Let me Buffalo, see if he's in my phone. Buffalo Grove on a so. or something like that. Let me see. If I have him. But they go all over. Um, he's a rock star. Because a lot of my a lot of our kids that do social groups, especially kids that are high functioning on the spectrum, complain that the other kids in the group aren't like them or talk about different topics other than what they're interested in. So they won't buy into the group. Justin is like, we are going to do this. If you would like to do so, please come. Um, and then he gets the buy-in and they go do fun stuff. Yeah. So I have his, oh, I have phone numbers and emails. Um, 773-679-7426. I probably just gave you his cell phone, but call it anyway. Um, and then his email is Justin Larson. L A R oh it's L A R Larson Justin L A R S O N Justin J U S T I N D at Gmail Larson Justin D at Gmail. And if you need other resources, feel free to reach out. We are always yeah. available. Yeah. My sister had a son. If you need to go, please don't worry about it. Okay. With Asperger's, and there's a guy, uh, she's DuPage County, but um, she had talked about a guy who, yeah, did basketball, took the kids out to the woods, that kind of stuff. Oh. So that's interesting because that would be, that would be. Yeah. you know, we, we like all our kids on the spectrum in a social group, and I would say we refer most of them to Justin because we kids don't want to sit around and talk, a certain and talk. Let them get out and do stuff. They don't know they're learning even. They're just having a good time. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, because mine's got social pragmatics, but not autism. But, uh, it could still it work. It the same support as somebody else. It well, could Justin, still work. Right. Sometimes it's him and, and a kid alone. It could be two kids. You know, it depends. Uh -huh. um, but he's been, I, I mean, I just love the guy because of the work he does. Does he build an underrated insurance? 
I don't know. I don't know. Can social workers do that? I'm not sure. Yes. Oh, yeah. so you can. Yeah, I mean, if you have an L, if he's an LCSW, we can yeah. Do the one merger, so. Yeah, I don't know. Um, again, thank you again for coming out. And if we can be helpful, give us a ring. Call him. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much, everyone, for your questions. And thank you, Jill and Jordan, for your Our presentation. Pleasure.